What's up, guys? I am Caleb Giddings. Yeah, I'm Keith. I'm Jack. And you are watching another episode of Gun Day Brunch, brought to you by Taurus USA and Guns.com. Taurus USA, we make reliable guns, we make affordable guns, we make awesome guns, and Guns.com, well, they make content, they sell guns, they do all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, currently, the slogan at Taurus USA is, that I'm just going to start throwing at people is uh, affordable doesn't mean cheap. And I actually uh, almost... Almost the other thing that I that I'm gonna put out there, and this is the platform to put this out here. I'm gonna put it out in the first what 30 seconds of this episode. I was having this conversation the other day with a media guy, and they asked about like the affordability of our guns. And I'm like, look, man, everybody has a every law abiding citizen has a right to own a reliable firearm for personal protection, concealed carry, home defense, whatever that is. We just so happen to make one that's $250 and works. So if somebody has got 250 bucks and that's all they've got and they're choosing between, you know, a $500 gun and making a car payment or a $250 gun and actually being able to pay their bills, they should get that gun. And if you don't like that and you don't support that, maybe you don't like the Second Amendment as much as you say you do on the internet. But anyway... That's a whole different episode that we could do. Today's Can episode. I just applaud Caleb for a well done read this time. Just yeah. absolutely stuck. We did not trip and fall this time. Excellently done, Caleb. Which means the next read, I'm just going to eat shit. Oh, yeah. Just it's face just, first. It's going to be a, a flaming dumpster. It's going to be a. The, it, we'll, we'll, the next episode will be titled Kobe's Last Flight. Um, That made my chest tight as it came out of my mouth. Too soon. Too soon. I'm glad we don't monetize this. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, they're going to they're gonna charge us. Yeah, they're going to be like, we, you have to pay. Uh, YouTube's going to be like, you have to pay us for hosting now. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, this episode, we're talking about FUD lore or FUD zoo myths, which is something that I just learned was a thing uh not too long ago but i've googled some of them and they're hilarious so we're going to talk about ones that uh you know ones that we don't like and i'm going to kick it to keith first and we're gonna we're gonna mess around we're gonna we're just gonna go let's roll let's roll the roll the clocks boys all right the fudzu myth in question the first one at least is the fact that uh i keep seeing it and i wish it would die in a fiery pit and we need to bury this thing and some would say in an unmarked grave, and I'm like, no, marked grave. We're going to put a grave marker right over top of this. And the grave marker is going to say, stop saying this stupid shit. Stop telling people that racking a shotgun is the brown note for bad guys. They just shit their pants and run away. It's not. Racking a shotgun is a fun mechanical thing, and it makes the happy chemicals go in my brain. I like racking pump-action shotguns. It's fun. But at no point in time have I ever heard a shotgun rack and immediately felt my bowels urge to void themselves. Like, but Keith, that's because you're that... a law-abiding citizen. If you oh, were yes. a criminal, well, let's let's pivot to our resident criminal. Jack, has a uh, shotgun racking ever made you poop your pants? No, but I told the guy I could tell the difference between a shell going in and not. Oh, which is true, because right? it does actually sound different. Yes, that, remarkably that different. Is, that, is a, that is a different noise. Hey, here's a here, here's a, a side note on the so like and I understand the deterrent, you know, people like to have deterrence, right? And we Look, know what that is, what that is, that isn't for bad like it, it's not a real thing. What that is is a sales tactic. That is a sales tactic from someone describing that a firearm is a defensive tool to someone who has not yet made the mental leap that the thing that this does for you is provide lethal force into an emergency situation that requires lethal force to resolve. That's what that shotgun does for you. What the racking noise, what the what the selling of the racking noise um, as a feature uh, to scare someone off is it's just it's just providing them this. Oh well, I I won't have to shoot someone because this noise will get it done. It's a half-ass measure. Right, it's, sort it's, of a, like... it's an assurance. It's a false assurance that, oh, I won't after I won't have to get this far, and it's the similar false assurance that, like, hey, if I just draw my gun and point it at someone, then they'll back down or they'll run away because nobody wants to be shot. Which all of us know, that's not how that's not how these encounters go. This the person you're pointing the gun at has probably had that happen to them before. 
that's one that I, I really genuinely dislike is the, uh, the, the people who say, you know, oh, well, most defensive gun uses don't involve a shot being fired and people are often scared off by the side of the gun and all of that. And that's true, but I'm also not willing to gamble my life that the guy that I point a gun at has never had a gun pointed at him before. Because to your point, uh, if you're being robbed by an actual professional criminal, they've had a gun pointed at them at some point in their life, possibly even recreationally. So we have to, I, I think that the nobody wants to get shot and nobody wants to shoot people are both true statements. Well, that last one's not entirely true. Most in, decent in general, they're, folk they're don't fairly accurate people. statements. However, yeah. we're we're planning for extreme cases. We're planning for extreme scenarios, and we should be comfortable using the language there. So I'm I want it to die. I want people to get the idea of racking a pump action as a defensive tool, like that this is a feature and not just a mechanical function of the gun. I want it to die. I need it to die. And we need to bury it in the marked grave of stop saying this shit. You know what I want to know? Um, Go ahead, Jack. There's a reason why you rack your shotgun at the beginning of an encounter. It's not because it'll scare the other guy. It's because you shouldn't have a round loaded in your shotgun because they're most part not drop safe. Yeah. yeah. That gun, the, the shotgun is not designed to be carried one in the chamber they're not floating firing pin. most of them are not firing floating firing drop pin. that thing the wrong way it will replicate a stick 320 um oh if, yes. oops like could someone hear that and decide they don't want to mess with you yeah sure they could also just as easily hear you start dialing 911 and decide they don't want to mess with you they could rattle your door, find it's locked, and decide, and decide. otherwise. There, yeah. there, are no, right. there are a number of ways, there are a number of preventative things that could happen. Why are you relying on this one? You know what I want to know, as sorry, as an aside, is why? what evolutionary thing made it so that clicky noises from guns scratch an itch in all of our brains? Ooh. Why do we all have that? Because everybody a here, very pleasing noise. I everybody on this call and everybody who's listening to the show has that. So I can explain it to you. It's not guns. It is tool orientation from the beginning of time. Fair enough. All right. You are standing at your barbecue grill. I want you to close your eyes. Imagine yourself. Crisp white vans, your nicest mm. jorts, mm. a kiss the cook, lightly stained apron on your chest. Mm. Perfection. And the burgers are just about ready to be pulled off of there. You reach down for your tongs. What do you do? Click, click. The test click. Click, click. Yeah, give a couple of test, test clicks. The reason why is you are assuring that your tool is about to work. It's part of your process as a human being. We do this since time in memorial. Look at spears from the Ice Age. And you will see how often they were retied to make sure mm -hmm. the point was staying on them. Because human beings, we have these little digits. Well, some are little, uh, not mine. Uh, but we like to test things and we like it's, to check things. And we, we pick things up and test and make sure we fidget. We do all sorts of little things with our hands to make sure our tools are going to work. And so when we hear that, when we hear the mechanical thing work, we have now had machines in our lives, late Roman era, I'd say, we could say, that we can hear that and we go, all right, that, that sounds like what it should that's sound the, like. That's the working noise. That's what makes me happy. I bet you when the ballista like clicked in and it locked into place, people were like, oh, love that sound. I know this thing's ready to go. Uh, okay, that makes sense. I am, uh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And it's, you know, exactly why a sound for me for example a sound that i find comforting is when i'm doing like load and make ready on a, on a stage with a revolver i will pull the hammer back just a little bit and spin the cylinder and the reason why i'm doing that is i'm making sure that in that gun for the first six or eight or whatever shots i have i have no high primers so i know that i'm going to get at least six or eight or whatever the capacity of that gun's loud noises out of it while I'm spinning that cylinder, it makes a very pleasant little noise. 
I like that. And then you scratch itch and brain. And it's because I, and you know, evolutionarily speaking, it's because I know my thing is going to work. Um, which interestingly, uh, revolvers working and not working brings me to my uh, little piece of FUD lore that drives me nuts because it is right in my wheelhouse, right? Like I am... You could the, say I'm the revolver guy, yeah. you know, I have, I've done a very good job of branding myself into this position and I'm very happy about it. Uh, and it drives me nuts when people are agreeing with me that revolvers are good and, you know, a, that revolvers are a viable option for personal protection. And, but they agree with me for the wrong reasons, right? They agree with me because can they'll I, say can something. Can I caveat that for just a second? Is there anything more annoying than someone who is on your side, but who is an absolute moron? No, uh, that's my least favorite thing is when people agree with me, but they're wrong. I would rather you disagreed with me and, and, and made good solid points or disagreed with me and were stupid than agreeing with me and being wrong about it and how, like you're agreeing with me but you are you, you're agreeing with me for the wrong reasons like they're like <laughs> hell yeah i get it brother and we're all just here like no not I'm like no that's not like not yeah here. like yeah because revolvers don't jam you're not like, that's this. not that's not why their revolvers are incredibly mechanically durable no please no so revolvers don't jam is mine right and it's obvious because one i dislike the word I I I don't I, I don't really care for the word jam. I don't care if people use it because it's universally understood when you're talking about a failure to complete the cycle of the, operations. The working. Yeah, and that's like I I try to not use it because I'm trying to be precise with my language. Uh, but if you say, if you come to me and said my gun jammed, I would immediately be able to intuit what that means. It means that your gun failed to complete the cycle of operations. Then we can go figure out what you mean by jam and fix your problem, right? No, no issues with that. No issues with other people using it. I try to not use it, uh, but that's a different that's a, that's a different episode that we've actually already done. But what I don't like about the idea and the phrase "revolvers never jam" is that it's not true. Revolvers will frequently not complete the cycle of operations. And the reasons why they won't complete the cycle of operations usually come down to people trying to treat them like they would treat a modern polymer frame striker fired nine millimeter pistol or putting crappy ammo in them. And because they are sensitive to crappy ammo, just like modern polymer frame striker fired nine millimeters, but in completely different ways. So for example, if you put, you know, Bubba's wicked piss and hot reloads in your 357 Magnum and you pull the trigger and you get primer flow and it blows the primer out of the primer pocket, you're not going to be able to pull the trigger. It's, I mean, you well, you can pull the trigger. You might not be able to advance the cylinder. Uh, and then when you go, if you somehow manage to get that cylinder out of the gun, which usually involves pushing the cylinder release, turning it sideways and hitting with a freaking mallet on one side... Now, when you go to extract those spent cases, B Bubba's wicked piss and hot reload has split open, and you also need the mallet to bang the the uh, ejector rod to get them out of there. So, the idea that revolvers don't jam is based around the idea that revolvers are incredibly resistant to neglect. Right? If I take this uh, my, the gun that's on my ankle because it doesn't have a red dot, my carry gun's got a red dot on it. But if I take my ankle gun, for example. And I put it in a sock drawer for a hundred years. That's in a climate controlled area in a hundred years. When I pull it out, if the ammunition is still viable, the gun will go off because nothing mechanical has happened to that gun in a hundred years in a climate controlled environment. But revolvers are not tolerant of abuse. And I would know I have abused the fuck out of a bunch of revolvers and I don't know if that would be true what uh, well you know it's hyperbole. There springs, well i i get that but let's yeah. let's be fair here there are springs under tension there are things in there that are becoming stress points over time is it possible it, yeah is it likely in 100 years 20 no doubt i have yeah, no doubt fair. in my mind 20 years pick it up and we it, go back it would depend it would Past depend on 50? any if any of the springs are actually under their failure tension if they're not in a neutral enough state 
So uh, I, I don't just worry about the spring itself, but like what the spring is connected to, just the slow bends and like other things. I I I I question if that would be possible, but I wouldn't know how to test it. So fact, we probably can. I mean, not well, because if you think about this, there are hundred years. Hey, remember that episode we did about CNR licenses? I can go on the internet, like if I if you had a CNR license, I could go on the internet and probably buy a hundred year old Smith and Wesson right now, and I would have almost it, guarantee that it hasn't been kept up. Yeah, and I would mm-hmm. have it mechanically examined to make sure it's safe to shoot in the sense that like it doesn't have any cracks or things in the frame or stuff like that. But you know, if I went and got and also by the way, a hundred year old gun is from the 1920s, so it's like Elliot Ness uh, level to us of technology, which. Mm, um we're we're about to enter the era where like the walter ppk was brand new yeah also i really don't like the meme that i saw recently that was this you know what i think a 30 year old m4 looks like and then it was <laughs> what a 30 year old m4 actually looks like and i'm like no sir it, it was like oh my god that's the sot mod 115 i'm not i'm not okay yeah that would hurt my feelings a little bit but the hundred year thing, regardless, you know, we could t- we could probably d- put some effort into testing that. But twenty years, without a doubt, uh, you know, and a more any more realistic use case is five years. Leave a loaded gun in a sock drawer for five years, take that out, and see what happens. You know, and uh, the uh, so the the point of that FUD myth is that that they're trying to get at that I appreciate is that revolvers are tolerant of neglect, but when you try to treat a revolver like a modern polymer frame semi-automatic striker fired pistol, bad things happen. And like even with my 10,000 round Taurus, I had to do regular maintenance on it. I had to check the freaking screws to make sure that they were tight. At one point I had to disassemble the cylinder, put blue Loctite on the ejector rod and screw it back in and unthread it and screw it back in and then hold it to make sure that the fairies and the blue Loctite went to the places where they're supposed to go. Um, and, uh, you know, some things like that. And they're, they're not maintenance free gun. When people say that they're super reliable, they tend to, they tend to ascribe to them that, so you, you say they don't jam. There's a spinoff myth that like revolvers are e- easy to use. And we've tackled that a little bit in previous episodes. And, uh, people will say, well, revolvers don't jam and revolvers are easy. No, revolvers are mechanically simple. And that allows those two other things to sort of be true in context, but you have to put them into the the context of those uses. You can't just say, oh, well, revolvers never jam and they're super easy to use. So you can buy a revolver, never shoot it once, and you are going to be fine. Like that's not how these machines work. Nope. So that's mine. Uh, that is my, my my big one right there. Jack, let's move on to yours. And what I, is your your bit of fun? I hear this lore? all the time, and I think I think I hear it because I'm I'm a giant monstrous human being, but I will often hear in gun stores and from FUDs, you're why I would carry 10 millimeter, 357 Magnum or 44 Magnum. And they like I hear that one a lot. And then I see like the kind of guns people carry 10 millimeter in 10 millimeter, especially has become a gun, a caliber that people is like, give it a lot of credence, but don't look at the load data and see that the loads are like half of what they used to be. Yeah. Most commercially available. Remember, 10 mil remember is just 40 the, Smith and Wesson. Like, the 40 came around. Right. And, like oh, it's that? really hot 40, but it's not, super hot and it's not what 10 millimeter once was and you can get full pressure 10 mil loads on uh, norma yeah, buffalo makes born one. makes that yeah, if, if, they, if they i am exist. out if i'm out in the woods i will probably have a 10 millimeter loaded with buffalo bore if i'm in brown bear country what about that 44 magnum taurus that you have uh that is for that is for black bear territory oh okay my bad. i want to be very clear here a, a black bear. bear or a large or smallish brown bear that 44 magnum Absolutely, but it is five rounds. That's you know a a grizzly is a gonna... fifteen hundred pound animal, and it does not want you there. Mm. And honestly, I don't think I'd want to be there with a ten millimeter. I'd want to be there with like a twelve gauge or a three hundred eight. <laughs> no like, joke. <laughs> one of our uh, one one of the the uh, somebody that we work with over at Taurus, they 
they they we did a podcast with them. They shot a bear twice with like a three thirty eight Win Mag. It decided no, I'm not going to die. Charged them over four hundred meters, covered that space in no time. They're as fast as a horse, and yeah. it ate five rounds of four fifty four Casul from a Taurus uh, raging hunter before it decided it didn't want to live anymore. And I firmly yeah. believe that it just decided it didn't want to live. It was like, all right, fine, you fucking got me. Um, the story right. is harrowing. If you guys want to check out the behind the uh, uh, by the horns podcast with Jesse and KC, where they talk to uh, Tana uh, Grenda about it. It's fantastic. Um, and that was a, but yeah, okay. So bears uh, aside, be, back to ten mil. Bears is the, bears aside, I want the high capacity magazine in the full ten pop. millimeters nowadays aren't loaded super hot. They don't have the best bullet designs in them. Like, I don't think I've seen 10 millimeter gold dot out there. It might exist. I've certainly the, never seen 10 the, millimeter the HST. Horny, the Hornady ones are all right. Let's see what our friends over at uh, Lucky Funner have. Uh, let's see. 10 millimeter, 10 millimeter, Zaw FMJ, Zaw FMJ, more FMJ. Here's some good stuff. You know, this is all pretty much, it's all pretty much like, um, uh, nope, that's Remington UMC. Hold up. We're going to scroll back up. We're going to sort by. I think, I think the myth of 10 millimeter, I, not the myth. I think the meme of 10 millimeter has started to influence the myth. Yeah. Okay. So here's a couple good ones. Uh, there is a 155 grain Barnes Vortex which is probably going mock Jesus out of that thing. And yeah, then that's a smoker. the one that I would actually probably carry if I was going somewhere with terrifying large animals with pointy teeth and claws would be the Federal's got a 200 grain A-frame, which is going 1,100 feet per second. <laughs> that is 9 mil velocity out of a 200 grain A-frame hollow point. Good Lord. It'll do something. So, okay, cool. What is that going to mean on the terminal side of that? Oh, by the way, it's 225 well, around. It's going super fast. Hopefully, the bullet is designed to open under that kind of speed. The A-frame is, yeah. That's a purpose-designed bullet for that. Okay, but... so the bullet's going to open, and it's going to do a ton of damage. What threat requires that? Bears. This is a hunting round. That's it. Like, it's, it's bear... Elk, moose, the, both the of which large will, will mess you up in a, in a fucking big way. Oh, no, elk and moose, moose give, will. Moose people, give zero fucks. People, you know, the whole like herbivores are harmless meme is so dumb. And it is, and you, I mean, to be fair, you you do not to, see that perpetrated by anyone who actually hunts. The, the mammal, to jump off our continent, I think the mammal with the highest body count is still the hippopotamus. Uh, Cape Buffalo also have a pretty you're high not, body you're count. Not killing, I I don't for a second think that you could drop a a a, a hippo with a ten millimeter. I don't think you could do a Cape Buffalo either. My boss shot a Cape Buffalo with a four sixty Magnum, and he shot it five times, and it was yeah, like they're mm, not, I think I'm gonna I, die I wouldn't, now. I wouldn't want to go to <clears throat> get back to us. I wouldn't want to go after a moose with one, even full power. No, like, absolutely not. No, I, it is when it, the weight of a, the animal starts with, or when the weight of the animal animal reaches four digits. Uh, <laughs> I'm out there's of a comma in that thing's weight. I am not going after it with anything short of like the turbo magnums. You know, like your four sixties and your five hundreds, which are just essentially straight wall rifle cartridges and a handgun. Sure, we'll do one of those. But not, no, 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 no. I, and I, I agree with the 10 millimeter stuff and that people know I am a pretty big fan of 10 mil, but you know, even when I had, but you know, and I'm also very upfront about this, even when I carried a 10 mil revolver as my EDC, I carried it with 40 Smith and Wesson. Like I carried, you know, 180 grain HSTs in moon clips right. with it, which is probably the, most hipster ass carry setup I've ever had. Uh, but, uh, but I would, yeah, I would rather have a 40 caliber HST than a 10 millimeter A frame super smoker round. Yeah. Did they even make a 10 mil HST? Let's see. Hang on. I'm just looking at the self defense options here on our good friend, uh, Trucky Punter. 
There's a uh, XTP. That's an okay bullet. They're probably pushing it fast enough. Oh, there's a uh, Critical Duty. Hornady's got a uh, Critical Duty. And Spears got a 200 grain. A 200 grain gold dot. Christ alive. Um, so, yeah, yes, there's it like. Does exist. There, it does exist. So there's two. Uh, yeah, there's two of them. There's Critical Duty and Gold Dots, which if you want to get a gun that shoots Critical Duty and shoots Gold Dots, you should probably just get, and you want it. And hey, look, all right, every now and then the fact that there's a four in the caliber scratches a happy part of my brain. I get that. I have a bunch of 45s. Uh, if you want a gun that starts with a four and you want to shoot a 180 grain Gold Dot, you should probably just get a 40. But I love 10 mil. Make no mistake, I do still love 10 mil. Um, I think the the interesting thing about all of this is, you know, we've spent so long, every single one of these bits of FUD lore, whether it's this, you know, the ones we've talked about, or things like slow down and get your hits, or slow is smooth and smooth is fast, started off based in a good intentioned idea for the most part, right? Like the shotgun thing was like, Hey, when you pump your shotgun, if someone hears it, if they, you know, realize what's happening, it could make them recalculate their decision, but don't bet your life on that. Be prepared, learn how to shoot, learn how to run your gun, etc. And I think that, you know, there's, there's a good, there's a good thought process behind all, well, not a good thought process. There's, there's good intentions behind all of this. And you end up in a situation though, where just like the game of telephone, which we've all played, well, is that game even going to exist anymore? Because people don't call each other on the phone. Like how do like Gen Z kids play telephone? Do they send each other garbled uh, Snapchats or something? How does that work? I don't know. There's also, there's also a weird trend where um, some of them are going back to legitimate, like old school flip phones and they're ditching the, um, they're ditching the smartphone. Some of them, some I of them, not, not a lot of them, but some of them are ditching the uh, smartphone trend. So it may become a hipster game. I, I don't, I don't even, uh, there are times where I'm like, you know what? I wouldn't mind getting rid of my, quote unquote smartphone um but to to kind of put a bow on this episode i think the thing that you know i want to i want to leave people with is the idea of fud lore you know ha 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 we like to laugh about all of that and that sort of stuff but a lot of this stuff is based on a concept that either made sense at the time or still makes sense. And you have to be able to move past the meme layer of the conversation to really internalize it. And while memes are great and memes are funny, if you just look at thing at everything as a meme, you can miss out on a lot of good knowledge. And, you know, speaking of you phrases... You can't leave it at surface level. Yeah. Speaking of phrases that are often misinterpreted or misused, uh, next week's episode, we're going to be talking about the phrase, mission drives the gear train, what that actually means, and how you can apply it to your everyday life. I'd like to thank everyone for watching, liking, sharing, and subscribing. Make sure you do those things. Please go ahead and kidnap someone and force them to listen to all 100 plus episodes that we've done. Uh, just put them in your Respectfully, car. Respectfully, of course. Put Respectfully, it on kidnap. blast. You know, make them listen. It'll be great. Everyone will have a good time and we'll have a new subscriber. Uh, thank you again. We'll be back next week with another all new episode of Gunday Brunch.